You are listening to the Auditory Entertainment's production of A Lavish Tale by R.M. Hicks. Performed by Miranda Johnson and Ryan Johnson. It is this way every morning. The birth of light rising up languidly like a bubble of air in a vial of oil. Every plant quivers minutely in anticipation of its promises. Every artist who gazes at it finds the word beauty clinging to his tongue. And every prisoner who bears witness to it succumbs to despair by the lonely weight of monotony. I am a prisoner. My crime is love. My cell is my life. The infant sunrise was a golden seam between the darkness of the sea and sky. Warm gusts of air caromed off the toiling ocean and forced the mighty eagle Wonderhorn to brace himself against their currents. His talons tightened on the stone perch of the tower, lest the winds push him catastrophically into the frail scaffolding used by the retainers. He pecked a side of beef out of a trough and gnawed on it a couple times to squeeze the savory taste of blood throughout his mouth, then swallowed it whole. When the retainers cranked up another portion, Wonderhorn felt a twinge of disappointment, for it usually meant he'd be flying inland instead of out to sea. Over the waters he was allowed to fish, hence a single serving on those days. Of course, the retainers recommended against it, fishing, that is, citing safety concerns and problems about wet leather straps and rusted buckles. But Wonderhorn's current companion loved the rush and the swoop and the spray of water on his face. Usually those ordained to the regal order of cloud knights were older, stoic, passionless men. To be assigned one with a tincture of youth and enthusiasm made Wonderhorn the envy of his brood. The eagles have observed that old men control conflict through authority. They watch battles from a surveyor's distance, shouting commands and implementing tactics. Young men, on the other hand, control conflict by fighting. Eagles live for battle. Wonderhorn has his scars, covered over patches of permanently ruffled feathers, and he was proud of them. He licked a blood squirt off the sharp point of his beak, and nodded his massive white head approvingly. The cloud knight, Sir Lavishton Moore, watched the retainers hoist up the bronze-trimmed crown, a petal-shaped windshield, then returned his anxious contemplations toward the distant, glimmering sea. He wore a brightly polished helm with a full face visor and golden wings flaring high off the back. Pauldrons sloped outward in such a way that, at a silhouette's distance, Lavish appeared to have wings. A breastplate hid underneath a swaying white tabard, immaculately embroidered with a swooping eagle. Padded gloves and boots were extra thick for the cold. And lastly, a long sword, with an elaborate hilt in a polished wooden scabbard, hung at his side. The white-robed avian master approached Sir Lavish Dinmore. He performed a quick spin of the arms so that the hefty feathered cuffs of his robe wrapped once around. Then he bowed humbly. A silver ponytail brushed the ground. He presented the young knight with the rod of delinquency, and for the first time of his five-year tenure, Lavish declined inspection of Wonderhorn. The avian master scrunched his bushy face in perplexity, then slackened with worry, for it occurred to him that in all his long years of service in the aviary, only thrice has he seen a cloud knight decline inspection. Knights relied on the pedantry of such customs. They were an integral part of discipline, and no knight survived without his discipline. It was his shield against fear, and without that shield, how could they stand against the terrors out there? Yet, on rare occasions, the final occasion... They forego the customs, as if to emphasize to all the futility of denying fate its due. 
The avian master looked hard into Sir Dunmore's hazel eyes, in hopes of ascertaining some clues as to his intentions. They were clear, emotionless, and blank, as the entire focus of the man was inside himself. The external world was trivialized. A gleam from the magnificent hilt of his sword drew the avian master's attention. That sword was the subject of much rumor and conjecture, as it was the source of Lavish and Moore's success and fame, the sword that held many secrets, and none did Lavish betray. To see that sword, to see him wield it, was to bear witness to death. The avian master made an assumption that he felt in his heart he knew to be true. That Lavish would not be returning from this mysterious journey. Lavish scratched at his red beard, which had the effect of bringing him back to the present, and he started off to the scaffolding. He paused alongside Wonderhorn's massive head. Little red droplets from this morning's breakfast speckled the edges of his mouth. They would be flying out this morning with a bloody beak. Lavish took it as an omen. Looking at the eagle's icy blue eye, he asked, You ready, my friend? Wonderhorn replied with a short affirmative call that forced the retainers to press their hands to their ears. They cranked away the catwalks as soon as Lavish buckled himself into the saddle. They lined up on the deck, Feathered collars and long hair, restless in the breeze. And Lavish performed a highly dramatic gesture. He unsheathed the sword he kept hidden from all eyes and saluted them. They gasped, seeing the brilliant blue gleam on the straight double-edged blade. Lavish and the sword disappeared as Wonderhorn backstepped off the perch. She only sleeps. I am always awake. When I embrace her, it suffers me, for I find in her only dreams. And the absence of her affection is the famine of my drought. They flew out to sea anyway. Wonderhorn heard Lavish issue a triple chirp from the whistle built into his helm, the command allowed the eagle to fly as fast and high as he pleased. His double heart sent a tingle up to his head and out to his wings. He squinted, even though the membrane over his eyes deterred most of the wind pressure, for this was how they smiled. Mighty cinnamon red wings stroked the air furiously, the gales of which has torn banners from their place, ripped roofs off of houses, and sent men sprawling on their backs. Sir Lavished and Moore held the sword high, straight, and rigid. Its sharply honed sapphire blade brightened from the exhilaration of the rapid ascent. In the stiff, constant pressure of wind, his arm wearied, but he would not relent from portraying what he was shown. When his arm trembled, he channeled his anxiousness into the blade, which stimulated its energies, and an electrical current surged through his arm and shoulder, locking the muscles up tight. The wind would now have to tear his arm off in order to bring the weapon down. Memories of the first time he beheld the sword stirred his thoughts. He had seen his face reflected on the mirrored surface. At a glance, he recognized its craft to be of some ancient elven kind. The weapon was not made of gems, but from metals forged by magics and compression. His face, distinct and pronounced on the blade, infused in him a notably ill feeling, for he didn't have a full beard as the reflection showed. The older self unsettled him, then frightened him as he considered the possibility that the sword might know him and may have even sought him out. Lavish resisted a gut reaction to just drop it. The hag who solicited the fabulous weapon wanted only bread in exchange for it. Sword in hand, he watched the old woman lead her basket-laden mule into the woods. She had done what she was obliged to do, and having completed it, having rid herself of the weapon, her life was no longer in peril. 
It occurred to him then that fate was no longer as oblique as the black gaps in dreams. It was now a swift current, rushing him headlong to the sea, over the falls. At first, these questions worried him, but that quickly faded, for the fire and feistiness that was his nature reassured him. It didn't matter where fate took him, as long as it stayed swift. A few years later, Lavish would be ceremoniously inducted into the Honorable Order of Cloud Knights. He traded in a hooved steed for an eagle. He grew a beard so that his face wouldn't freeze. In the long quiets of travel and sleeplessness, while idly enamored in the weapon's craft, he felt the stir of consciousness. He learned the sword had a name. Tumult. Over time, he felt her in there and learned of a place important to her. The Bavora Isles. Fate's tide rushes lavish toward it now. Bavora Isles is a place of mystery and legend and lost to most travelers. Surrounded by a persistent, impenetrable fog, they became isolated and dangerous, transforming from a mystical paradise into a breeding ground for wyverns and other fiends. The Order of Cloud Knights disavowed contact with it decades ago, calling it a desolation and nothing more. Yet Lavish discovered otherwise in Tumult. Altitude set. Speed a casual glide sustained by the occasional stroke of wings. Lavish guided Wonderhorn onto the necessary trajectory, as determined by Tumult. In a previous epic, Bavora was home to fairies, those mischievous prodigies of the arts and the fates. The fairies have this innate talent for manipulating the rawest particles of essence. From these slivers of essence that had touched a person's life force, they constructed silvery strands of light. With these filaments, they fashioned beautiful webs. The webs grew on their own, attuned to the emanations of time and consciousness. These webs trace the life and events of those persons from whom they were formed. The strands grew toward other webs as people's lives interacted. Children formed new spindles. And then there are those persons whose authority and prestige is so great that their influence became a web of its own. All these people's lives are woven into one another's web. Web upon webs. Whole sections of forest became encased in these silver, gossamer blankets. Time brings old age to mortals. And old age is the absence of fate. Those webs curl in upon themselves, becoming a cocoon of memories just hanging there forever. I imagine what mine must look like. A thing of stunted growth. A thing powerless to expand. Has mine already begun twisting in upon itself? Is it a bland, shapeless mass maligned by a stagnate life? Until I free her, I cannot live. The day was waning and Lavish had grown painfully stiff in the saddle. There was only ocean and sky, and no place to rest. He would have had Wonderhorn land on driftwood if he thought it would allow him a minute to stand and stretch. The sudden appearance of the fog drove out all discomfort, for he entered it, and it engulfed him without any warning. He had, of course, sheathed tumult many hours ago, but brought her out now so that her glow might confirm the accuracy of their flight. Many minutes passed away in the mist, when Wonderhorn slowed and condensed the spread of his wings, his head moving to and fro as he attempted to see through the fog the enemies his keen smell had discovered. A guttural screech rumbled out his throat to alert Lavish of the potential danger. They first appeared as a shadowy disturbance within the grayness. Lavish could guess as to what they might be, but he encouraged Wonderhorn to keep as much distance from them as possible. 
and, quite unexpectedly, the fog thinned, and the Bavora Isles became obvious as tall palisades poked out of the white haze. Lavish heard the whining caw of the seagulls that lived and mated amongst its sheer walls. He heard the crash of the surf like a mellow tempo under the rush of wind, and saw the unsettling silhouettes of wyverns. Mythically, they were the lowliest, most degenerate breed of prehistory's dragonkin. They possessed long, snaky bodies, mottled green and brown, and wiggled awkwardly through the air with the aid of stubby, feathered wings. Beaked maw, spiky neck, and a poison-filled stinger for a tail, they hunt down anything they can sting, gouge it, then follow it until it succumbs. They could not have known Wonderhorn was immune to most poisons, including theirs. And they were much smaller than Wonderhorn, but the terrifying danger they posed was a propensity to swarm. Lavish speedily passed over several vast clusters of earth, their foundations laden under the burden of jungle. The air around Bavora seemed thicker and denser than the norm. Ruins of civilizations littered the cliffs of the main island. Vines lounged on the balconies. Weeds rooted in the crumbling roads. And the trees rose up through the roofs, their canopies spreading over the ruins, as if protecting the broken and wounded buildings from the weather's tyranny. The ruins succumbed to the jungle, and the island's green floor stretched past the horizon in every direction. Gradually, the elevation climbed until a gray, flat-topped mountain loomed in the distance. He had seen the volcano before. Tumult showed it to him during dreamy meditations. Wyverns nested all along its barren neck. Over the rim, the caldera fell deeply, its basin cooled by a pristine green lake. Centered in the caldera, an ivory dome poked out of the water that served as a foundation for a sleek, turret-crowned tower. Their presence was no longer tolerable, and the wyverns flew toward Wonderhorn in mass. Lavish knew he had to prevent them from swarming, and his only option now was to frighten them. Lavish chose an enormous, brutish wyvern, full of rancor, and charged toward it. The wyvern responded in kind, its pigeon-gray wings whipped up and down, its thorny tail curled underneath with the stinger pointed toward the front, and its beaked mouth was open wide, screaming defiance. The bold wyvern suddenly thought differently of the situation seeing the giant eagle coming down fast with talons out. It stopped screaming and started slowing, but it could neither stop nor change course fast enough. Wonderhorn swooped down upon it, ably snatching the head in his mouth, then tearing it off. Gray feathers and spurts of blood littered the air while the body twisted and jerked in death spasms until splashing into the lake. Wonderhorn soared the volcano's rim, gnawing on his trophy. Blood flowed out the remnants of the neck, widening into brownish-red ribbons and trailed behind like some necromancer's macabre banner. I believe in fate. I know, without a doubt, that it exists. Unfortunately, the dreariness of a day dulls the luster of destiny. An unbroken chain of empty days sours all destinies into remorseful tragedies. The flavor of past victories flattens, and the burn of failure inflames. As such, tedium causes one to want to blasphemy against destiny, to repudiate and dispute its very existence. But it does exist, forever cemented and embalmed by premonition, by the perfect clairvoyance of intuition. To be specific, let your arrival serve as an example. I knew at once through the tensions and heightened agitation of the wyvern, that their distress was your doing, tumult. Though it could have been anybody or anything, storms, 
earthly tremors, migrations of sharks that deplete their favorite food, or even thieves and knightly fools with eyes lusting for glory and treasures. They come infrequently, but they do come. It could have been anyone, but I accepted premonition and knew it was you. For it has been the remembrance of you that has invaded my thoughts of late. I am glad you have come, Tumult, for you provide me with a needed distraction from the toils of loneliness. Ah, such memories we have had. If ever there was a nemesis of your equal, I know not who. Yes, you shall serve as an eager distraction, an outlet for my frustrations. We shall have many long engagements as I pull from you the knowledge of how you knew to find me here. And your host, I hope he is not important to you because I am going to have to tear him from you, rip him from you like a fingernail out of a cuticle. His fate is my anger now. A deafening thunderclap shook the air with a ferocity that caused Wonderhorn to jerk. Lavish looked to the tower, expecting to see it broken or blasted to rubble. It was intact and encapsulated in a bubble. The wavering, unsteady translucence of the bubble reminded Lavish of a mirage caused by searing heat. At the epicenter, which was the top of the tower, a dark mass formed and began taking on a monstrous shape. The shadowy mass sprouted a long neck of corded muscle and a mane of ivory horns, four sinewy arms and four reptilian legs, and a sleek tail that skimmed the lake's surface. A ferocious howl from the dragon dispersed the bubble, and a single swipe of the immense wings cast waves upon the lake and thrust it easily into the sky. It was so immense, so grand and frightening, that Lavish's senses faltered. Everything sort of froze, as though the magnitude of the image couldn't be actualized, as if his senses had gone into shock. Its size was too large to see all at once. The dragon flew swiftly and smoothly, its front wings tapered and bony, retracted against its body, pumping the air back. A second pair, set further along the spine, were rounded and flapped downward in perfect synchronicity with the front. Its many eyes speckled on a dark, knobby maw and glistened like polished black pearls. The pearls twitched and kept tumult in their focus as it pursued them. Wonderhorn flew in a broad upward spiral over the caldera, then angled down on a hard right, intent on testing the adversary's agility. Tumult's blue shine brightened to a glare as the intensity of the descent quickened, forcing Lavish to avert his eyes. Was this brilliance a manifestation of her excitement? He heard the grumble of an earthquake. It was the dragon's growl. Its head lurched on that taut neck and opened a mouth beset with rows of sharp teeth that careened toward Wonderhorn. The eagle quickly twisted, avoiding the snap of its maw. Lavish's heart paused in his chest, painfully so. At the same time, there was a loud electric crackle and blinding flash of light as Tumult discharged a magnificent plume of energy. Spots of afterglow and nausea confounded Lavish. When Wonderhorn swooped in a new direction, he lost all orientation. Tumult's blast had the effect of knocking the dragon out of the air, causing it to collide against the wall of the caldera. The gray dust of the impact continued to billow up as it clung there, straining its head to find where they went. Its many eyes blinked and winced, blinded by the liquid black rivulets that dripped from a sizzling wound in its face. Wonderhorn zipped up along the flank of the dragon, then ably looped downward in a remarkable display of acrobatics and raked his talons along a wing. The dragon's head righted stiffly, its chest expanded, sucking in air, and it trumpeted out its pain in a concussive roar that hit Wonderhorn with a wall of sound. 
The roar physically pushed Wonderhorn down, causing him to splash against the lake. After a brief struggle for control, Wonderhorn lifted up off the water and circled around the base of the tower to gain momentum, while the dragon flew up to a position above them. The dragon seemed preoccupied, sucking in huge gulps of air, and the opportunity was not missed by Wonderhorn, who hastened toward the blue ceiling, streaking past the dragon and out of the caldera. Acceleration and gravity pinned Lavish to the saddle. He felt, more than he heard, a grumble building up from behind them and wrenched his head around over his shoulder. He expected to see the dragon. Instead, he saw a meteoric ball of flame lurching toward them. Dive! Lavish screamed. Wind slammed his words back into his face, yet Wonderhorn heard him clearly enough and did exactly as Lavish commanded. He tucked his wings, shifted, and stiffened the tail, and they swung down and forward. The sky exploded. Heat and brilliance expanded over the volcano as vast as a sunset. Wonderhorn flapped, but continued to fall. His wings found no substance, as if all the air had been burned up. Finally, his wings gripped the wind before the trees broke their fall. Lavish could smell the heated metal of his helm and the eagle's burnt feathers. He was ready to go back. This opponent wasn't his for the taking. Maybe not even the whole order of cloud knights could defeat this foe. It was possible some of them even knew it was here, and that's why they stayed away. Then Tumult hummed with static fervor. Apparently she wasn't done, and neither was Wonderhorn. They circled wide, keeping just above the jungle canopy. The torrent of his wings thrashed the hardy trees with a hurricane's fury. Wonderhorn raced up the igneous gray neck of the volcano like a circus chariot on a ramp, launching the eagle into the sky. They came down even faster. Lavish's head felt as if it were wrapped in ice. The wind rushing past was as loud as a scream. He felt something wet smear across his cheek. Was it blood? An intense sensation of heat made him think the dragon was exhaling another inferno, but did not have the wherewithal to know for sure. Wonderhorn spiraled round a column of fire like a child sliding down a pole. He passed right behind the dragon and latched onto its tail. Talons and beak pulled off long strips of meat and yanked the dragon out of the sky. It collided into the tower, demolishing a turret and sending cracks down the shaft. Wonderhorn gracefully leveled out and skimmed over the water. Another stream of flame reflected orange across the lake and blasted into the caldera wall just ahead of them. It splashed like spurting lava, and there was no way to avoid it. Tumult emitted a bright glow, blinding lavish. It felt like a mule kicked him in the chest. There was a deafening crash of thunder the moment his heart stopped. Part 2 For a long time, nobody knew lavish had Tumult. He maintained her secrecy, guarding her zealously. He only looked upon her in private, fearing the envy of the public should they learn. Her beauty captivated him, and to touch her warmed him. She reached out to him, comforted him, and encouraged him. It took him many seasons to learn to use her, to allow his own emotions to channel into her and fuel her power. Her electric crackle spoke of eagerness and ambition. Her strength, prevalent in the brilliance of her flair, inspired a passion and yearning. And, as with any true love, they bonded. They connected empathetically, their triumphs and sorrows riding on a flood of shared imagery. Only in secret did he take her out to look at her. He'd marvel, and she'd glow a dull gleam of blue. They would share their memories, They were full of tragedies. He'd weep, and she'd glow a tense, luminous white. (laughs) 
Lavish awoke with the afterglow of tumult lingering in his pupils. When the image faded, there was only darkness and vague outlines of silhouettes upon silhouettes. Where was tumult? She responded by providing a comforting blue aura. He still held her, though he could not feel his hand grasping her. His head throbbed. Each pulse of blood was like a drumstick's rap. Nausea and hunger urged him to just curl up, but he was still strapped in his saddle. He felt himself rocking and swaying gently. Was he on water? He tried to speak, but couldn't. His whole right side appeared to be locked up. Tumult had maintained a current. He willed her to stop, and she slipped from his numb hand. Fool! He panicked, fearing she might descend into the depths and would have shouted, but could not find his voice. He heard her clatter on stone and sighed in relief. The rocking motion must be Wonderhorn's breathing. His helm stank of sweat. Pulling open the full-faced visor, cold night air splashed upon his face. Thick gloves and soreness made him struggle with the buckles that kept him strapped in. Freed, he slid down Wonderhorn's neck and crumpled up on the floor. Stiff joints and weakness in his muscles made it feel as though a hundred years had snuck up on him. Tumult twinkled under the starlight, and the moment he picked her up, a word squirmed through his headache and into the forefront of his thoughts. Down. Down? Down? He muttered through a parched mouth, not understanding how the word forced itself upon him or what it even meant. As he looked about and his eyes began to distinguish differing degrees of blue in the darkness, he noticed the nearby outline of a tall spire silhouetted against the night sky. He was on top of Bavora Tower and facing one of its turrets. First things first, he said to himself, or to Tumult. He wasn't exactly sure. Then climbed up Wonderhorn's neck to fetch a saddlebag. There was a smell about the eagle, one of ash and dryness. He retrieved a large leather pouch, eased it down to the floor, slid back down, cradling a hefty water skin in his arms. He splashed water over his face, drank a few mouthfuls, and the rest he gave to Wonderhorn. Inside the pouch, Lavish pulled out several items. A doe-skin roll of smoked venison, a latched wood box with medicines, and a sealed wooden tube. The lid of the tube easily popped open. It contained a velvet sack, and from it he poured a silver chain and a pendant into his hand. After a few awkward minutes of humming, he finally got the pitch of his voice just right, and the pendant emitted a pink light. The pendant didn't really have a source of light. It was more of a pink luminous bubble that surrounded him and rested across the surface of the floor. He inspected Wonderhorn's seared head and touched the crisp, frizzled feathers. At the bald spots, he noticed blistered flesh. Oh, Wonderhorn. Lavish moaned sympathetically. I'm sorry, boy. Down, repeated the soundless voice. He disregarded it and continued his guilt-ridden inspection of his beloved friend. Blood had congealed in the groove between the beak and flesh. He looked up into Wonderhorn's glossy, dilated eye and heard the eagle wheeze from pain. Wonderhorn first, so we can leave when need be. Lavish said to Tumult, then realized that she had been sheathed. Was this the first time she'd communicated with him without being in direct physical contact? That is, of course, assuming it was her that even uttered the insistence. Words, after all, was not the means by which she previously communicated. He stood there wondering how far the connection went. How deep did the bond seed? How much of her seeped into him? Being here was her design, the dragon, her foe. Remembrance of the dragon stabbed him with fear. Lavish decided he had better hurry. 
He patted Wonderhorn on the beak, then prepared a hunk of venison with some glowing green jelly from the medicine box. It was the only thing not illuminated pink, and its formal name was a language spoken only by alchemists. For eagles only, as the jelly was known to cause permanent blindness in men with a mere lick. After feeding it to Wonderhorn, he prepared a little something for himself. Something to ease the stiffness, relieve his headache, and a little something else to keep him up and motivated. Sincerely, and with a firm strictness in his voice, Lavish said, Wonderhorn, if the dragon returns, leave. It is necessary and my command that you do so. You won't be blamed, and this is not your fault. Our purpose here is not something I understand. He knew the eagle understood him, but did not know if it would obey. Not even dogs are as loyal as eagles. Amulet in one hand, tumult in the other, Lavish passed through the arches of the spire-topped turret and descended into the tower. A set of stairs twisted down into a circular room void of furnishings, its ancient wooden floor creaking under his feet. Across from him, the night sky filtered in from a hole where a second turret had once been. He found another set of wooden stairs. He heard their brittleness with each step. Then he heard movement, shuffling, and the patter of claws. He peered suspiciously into the blackness outside the pink. He heard a loud groan from the step underneath. It broke, and so did the next and the next, and the whole set of stairs cascaded into a heap, leaving Lavish sprawled amongst the debris. Something tugged on his boot. Startled, Lavish yelped, kicked, and leaped to his feet, only to stumble on the broken steps and fell to his knees. The air stank. It was stale and thick with a stench similar to a kennel. On the cusp of the bubble, a rat-like tail, as thick as a man's leg, stirred the dust as it swept out of view. Movement and sound came from all around, scuttling, claws tapping, and squeals. He saw a large face, vermin-like, mangy, without eyes, not even sockets. It had a bizarre, brain-shaped fungal growth on top of its head, and large, flimsy, veiny ears. Something grabbed him from behind and yanked him down. He grunted and slashed at it. Dozens of faces lurched toward him. Rats the size of dogs swarmed and engulfed him. One knocked his visor down and saved his face from being chewed off. Sharp needle-like teeth appeared in the eye slits as the vermin nibbled at the helm, ravenous for the fresh meat wrapped inside. Lavish tried to kick and twist. Tumult cut them with each touch, but their weight kept him pinned, and she did not deter their hunger. They chewed most of the leather from his legs and arms. Their teeth pricked him at his skin. He thrashed frantically. Teeth grabbed hold of exposed flesh on his thigh and tore it away. Tumult! He screamed in pain. She responded. A razor honed to whole new degrees of sharpness by the steady current of electricity. She carved through hide and organ and bone, and she met no resistance. He swung her in wide arcs, slaying groups of vermin in a single stroke. The tower became a raucous concert of eating, lapping, and the occasional scratch of teeth on bone as the vermin cannibalized their dead. Lavish broke free and found his way to a wall and put his back against it. His tabard was shredded. Smeared blood blackened his breastplate and helm, and his boots and gloves were heavy from the grotesque saturation of it. The room's stale air became rancid with the hot reek of bowels and blood. Lavish gagged, lifted his visor, and vomited. Mostly bile, and a few chunks of venison. <sighs> Rats will probably eat that, too. Even in this lake's shallow depths, the sonic death screams of the tower's vermin are softened into murmurs. 
They are hideous beasts. Quite seemly indeed. But when they sleep, they dream. And when they dream, they sing. It is like bird song. Simple, unmelodious, and soothing. Almost as soothing as the deep trenches of this lake. This is why so many of my ilk choose to hibernate in its fathoms. The blackness, the pressure, the melancholy groan of the world's foundations, they are a sublime comfort. I was asleep, my consciousness having succumbed to the pain. The vermin have awakened me, and now I wonder about your motives, your ambitions. I assumed you had come to torment me, and that completed, I thought you would leave. You have not, and your host still lives. A discharge of the magnitude it took to sunder one such as myself should have expelled all the life force out of him. The static should have at the very least incinerated his tiny brain. Well, that's what you did to my necromancers anyway. But do you think I am slain? Do you think me dead and the tower is now for your pilfering? I doubt it. Do you think me, wounded, bleeding, recovering in the tower cellar? Unlikely. My wealth? Maybe. The throne? Perhaps. Beware, tumult. There is a wickedness in my tower, fouler than the rats. Steal some treasures, sit on the throne, but don't stay long and venture no further. If you find her, I will rise. I will borrow from the earth to exterminate your honorable host. And you don't want to have to spend an eternity here with me. A delicate metal railing encircled a void, the great hollow of Bovora Tower. Lavish leaned out over it and felt the suck of gravity tug from the well of the tower's belly. And as he peered down into the black, into that absence. He wondered what other terrors awaited. Tired and wounded, he did not want to continue, and decided it was time to saddle Wonderhorn and leave. Tumult locked up his whole body. His heart raced. His breathing stopped. She had total control of him, had meshed with him entirely, and she insisted on going down. Dizziness followed her release. He reluctantly complied to her demands and found steps made of metal with a brocade of vines and fan-shaped leaves. Tentatively, he tested the steps, and their stability satisfied him. There are thirty-six differing tales, immortalizing my beloved Aveline. I know them all word for word, from the beautiful ballads to the elegant epics. I know them all, for they are all of my creation. I sing them to my harpies who relate the arias over the ocean. The notes resonate in sailors' heads, their unconscious minds comprehending what their timid ears cannot. And each tale has only fragments of the truth. I like to be the villain. In the stories, I am scandalous, craven, evil. But when we met, I was not. I was abandoning my role in a catastrophic past and striving towards new ambitions. Our relationship was mutual. Aveline sensed and wanted exposure to the power hidden underneath my human guise. I wanted whatever it was that was happening. It was something wonderful. Aveline had a guardian, a fairy. The fairy loathed my kind. The curse, it is the fairy's fault. The evil that followed, the destruction from my hand, 
It is the fairy's fault. Someday I will find this fairy and will no longer be bound to Aveline, to this tower or this wretched island. Lavished and Moore's legs had gone wobbly from fatigue and the weight of armor. Still, the bottom was nowhere to be seen. Only blackness, both vast and close. The tower didn't seem quite as big from the back of Wonderhorn. The rats followed him. More accurately, they followed the dribble and puddles of blood that sponged out his boots. Their squeals and claws that clicked on the metal steps filled out the absence. At last, the steps ended at a smooth stone floor. Yet, disappointingly, the hollow continued into further darkness. Another set of stairs, these made of marble, twisted away from the wall. Elaborate stone railings secured either side of the steps, and he noticed the frieze of their decor was of fish, squids, and exotic water creatures. About two dozen steps later, he saw a pair of pillars whose walls were sculpted into tentacles. He found a floor. It was made of gold coins. Oh, tumult. Is this what we came for? Is this what you sought? Lavish exclaimed and could not contain the glee from lacing his words. He was neither greedy nor hungry for loot, but the wealth accumulated here was exhilarating to behold. Piles of coins formed chest-high swells. Weapons, armor, statues, and vases lay partially buried in those swells like villages consumed by desert sands. Outside the pink bubble, the darkness of the room lightened from a subtle illumination originating from the other end, where stood a prominent cluster of silvery stalactites. Lavish stared, mouth agape, the amulet falling from his hands as he strode as quickly as his legs could carry him through those shifting hills of coins. He stumbled over some sort of fountain laid on its side, and the dust tickled his nose. He swam through the coins like a man struggling in quicksand and tumbled out of their swell onto a soft padded carpet. On his hands and knees, staring at the stalactites, he realized they were spires around the back and sides of a pure white throne. The base of the throne and its high back were fluted, the embellishments giving the throne an oddly skeletal appearance. Its luster was of ivory, not metal. The throne radiated a warmth, soothing like bathwater. It radiated energy. Lavish felt it, and he was no adept. He stayed there on his hands and knees, gawking at the throne, left hand kneading the lush rug, the other tight around tumult. He thought of kings and lords stiffly positioned on their thrones of wood or stone, emblazoned with silver and gold. They were mere chairs compared to this. Lavish's imagination conjured dozens of opulent visions, all of them with him on the throne, relaxed and dignified, and tumult lying on a velveteen pillow whose colors and frills depended upon the sacred bearer's masculinity or femininity, robed or armored. This carpet remained, but the treasures had been cleared out revealing a tiled floor of glossy checkered marble panels. His mouth was dry, but he swallowed anyway. This is what you came for? This is what you want, isn't it? Was this your home? Were you once a queen? Queen Tumult, the beautiful queen of Bavora, with an electric smile and energetic charm. He held Tumult up before his blood-smeared face, wearing a weary, triumphant smile. In her, he sought confirmation. He found only a sense of anxiousness. It felt like the static buildup of wool, the way it tingled and tickled the hairs of his forearm. Was the dragon still alive? Did it still lurk here? Vivid recollections of sharp rows of teeth and its many beady eyes made Lavish shiver. The grinding of stone 
sent his hairs on end. He quickly scanned the darkness, guessing at the sound's location. At the end of the carpet, just past its tassels, a faint line of light appeared. The carpet bunched up as a marble panel lifted out of its place, and a dim blue light expanded. Lavish stepped cautiously away from the gathering carpet. The panel stopped, and the soft, renting light shifted. He stepped forward, hesitantly, sword at the ready. Horns appeared, gnarled, ribbed, stout and coiling in a goat-like spiral. Between them was a spiky tuft of hair, then a black nose, a dog's nose as big as an infant's head, sniffed and snorted. Lavish heard a saliva-wet growl. The horns and snout disappeared. Lavish gripped Tumult with both hands. Now their anxiety was the same. The horns and snout reappeared suddenly, along with the whole head and torso. Tight, muscular arms suspended it in the hole. It was wolfish, with large, lemon-yellow eyes and a thick, bushy mane that ran all the way down the middle of its back. The hairs across its sinewy chest and narrow stomach were short and gray. Its vicious, hungry snarl echoed through the chamber. Tumult urged Lavish not to stall. He didn't. Lavish lunged forward, striking the fiend's arm before it could pull itself out. Tumult cleaved it off. The horns disappeared again, but the creature was fast. It grabbed Lavish's ankle and took him down the hole. The fall was a swift fourteen feet. The beast cushioned Lavish's collision enough to prevent injury, but it still knocked the wind out of him. Enraged with pain, the lupus fiend kicked Lavish with a strong hooved leg. He slid across the floor, lubricated by spurting blood, until a pillar abruptly halted him. Lavish glanced around at his surroundings. The room was lined with buttresses, and perched between them, on brick stools, slept apish stone gargoyles. Desperate gulps of air seemed blocked by the visor, so Lavish flipped it up, but it helped little. The beast bit hold of pauldrons and its teeth penetrated the metal. The nose was cold and wet against his cheek. It shook Lavish around like a doll. His feet banged harshly on the floor. Finally, the buckles and straps of the shoulder guard ripped. Lavish skidded and rolled to his knees. His breaths came harsh and ragged and with little air. Black spots full of stars splotched his vision. Teeth thunked against his helm, and with one swift jerk it tore the visor away. The teeth lunged for his face. It ate tumult instead. At last the air came as Lavish watched the vile fiend's dramatic death. The beast flung itself back and leaped into the ceiling several times before it crumpled down, supine on the floor, twitching while it bled a pool of slick brown that could have filled a trough. Lavish lay there on the hard floor, recovering and hallucinating. It was like looking through an oracle's crystal ball, the images clear, yet edged in a fog. He saw a balcony with a waist-high beige brick retaining wall. The sky was dark from heavy bulbous clouds brightened from lightning, lightning that streaked in jagged wedges down the front of the balcony. They strike, continuously, fervently, as if summoned. Next scene, dusty bird's eye of combatants slaughtering each other at the base of cliffs. In the blue sky, wyverns approached, marshaled by the dragon, its double pair of legs and arms distinct to lavish now. The dragon has a name, Karinko Raz. Tiers of crenellated brick walls atop the cliffs lined the right of his vision. The sky grew dark. The wyverns carry a package, ogres wielding double-bladed axes as big as mules. If the wyvern survives a hail of arrows, it drops the ogre off on the wall. Otherwise, ogres fall hard. 
Karenko Roz sears the wall with flame. Sometimes he gets a wyvern. Foolishly, he moves too close to the walls. Ballisti, which had been hidden until this moment, unleash a volley of sharp harpoons with tails of chain. For a moment, Karenko Roz looks like a puppet on black strings. He tugs and chains snap. Then the lightning strikes a flurry of angry bolts. It wrecked him and cast him upon the cliffs, cascading him into the armies. Flash of brilliance. New scene. Karenko Roz laid out like a fish on a slab. He's held down by large stone blocks connected to chains. Armored guards wielding tall pikes and heavy crossbows surround him. Sorcerers took turns punishing him with painful jolts of electricity. This punishment lasted day and night. People came from all around to watch. Next scene. A crisp white world of an alpine winter from the top floor of a hamlet. Tents of armies mixed amongst the clean snow like a rash. Atop a bristling green pine tree, a hideous little bat-winged fiend carries a roll of parchment. It's an imp, an emaciated, blackened, fetal-looking creature with insect eyes. The parchment said, Karinko Roz was free. It's from Karinko Roz. Lavish knew this, though he's ignorant of the language. Tumult will learn that goblin assassins and mercenaries rescued him. Sometime later, in the middle of the night, friends become enemies. She is betrayed, and Karinko Roz captures her. Yellow torchlight flickers over black hoods. The hoods bob rhythmically. They may be chanting. There was no sound. They may be human, or goblins, or even demons. They killed her slowly, bled her from the wrist and ankles. When the last breath lingered in her throat, the necromancers worked their magic and grabbed her consciousness, a transparent blue oval wrapped in electric tendrils. A sword, Lavish's sword, was enveloped in a cocoon of delicate silvery strands. It became bright, and he felt chilled. Next, a ceremony with a squat, scarred, wide-jawed orc. He's a chieftain who wears a headdress of red feathers and knife blades, a leather collar with bone spikes, and a lay of viper fangs. Wrapped in black silt, tumult was given to him. Tribal festivities now. Big bonfire. Hordes of naked painted orcs. Dancing. Screaming. Rattling weapons at the starlit sky. The chieftain stood on the backs of slaves. He held tumult to the stars. But she is not his. She is her own. She incinerated him in a blast of hot white. The hallucinations end. The room had no visible source of light, though its soft illuminations seemed brighter in the center, where it enveloped a four-poster bed. Lavish approached the bed apprehensively, making cautious glances at the stone-sculpted demons crouched and catatonic on their pedestals. Master sculptors chiseled the bed out of a solid block of green and red banded onyx. A shallow translucency clung to the smooth, polished surface. Sheer sheets of white silk filled the gaps between glossy posts. A sturdy chair faced the bed. Its red velvet upholstery on the arms and seat were worn to a smooth sheen. The gossamer curtains were parted in front of the chair, and Lavish saw strands of hazel-brown hair spill over white pillows. Lavish used tumult to widen the part. Her face was white, delicate, an artisan's perfect mask of alabaster with long tapered ears. Was she elven? A succubus? The dragon? No, definitely not, said intuition. 
but important to the dragon he knew, the chair somehow confirmed that. The chair and her slightly gaunt face of high, rounded cheeks and deep-set eyes induced some distant notion of tragedy. He felt the loneliness, real as cold, as if time and brooding somehow saturated the air. You? Tumult? No. Her body was slain. She had shown him that. Who? Recollections of fairy tales lofted to the forefront of his thoughts. The Eternal Dreamer, a princess named Aveline, cursed to sleep by a jealous sorcerer. He thought the tale through, but couldn't remember how it ended. Happily? Tragically? How did it end? Lavish realized he held Tumult by both hands. The hilt pointed at his head. The blade tip poised inches above Aveline. He heard the sound of stone crack and slide against itself. He heard the thud and felt the rumble of the ground as the gargoyles awoke. How did it end? Tumult glowed blue. Crisp lines of white rippled up the blade. She urged him to plunge her, to impale Aveline through the heart. Stop! He seethed the words his jaw clenched by the electric charge she channeled to control his muscles. No! Don't! He fought, resisted. N not with my hand! Sorry. The world glared with pure brilliance as tumult exploded. The drain that she stole from Lavish robbed him of his senses, the gargoyles pinned him. Their solid granite bodies were the weight of boulders. They crushed his limbs, and he didn't even feel it. They pecked the metal knobs off the sleeves of his arms and legs. They slid the bent gold feathers on his helm through their stone lips, straightening them out like a pruning bird. They poked holes in the breastplate and peeled it away. They froze and craned their heads up when the tower began to shudder. For a moment, as brief as a butterfly's flutter, Lavish Dunmore saw himself lying there, beaten, bloodied, and hapless. He was dead. He was dreaming. He felt her more keenly and lively as ever before. He was aware for the first time that the bond with Tumult went both ways. A sliver of his essence was a part of her. It may not be in the fullness and richness of reality, but they were together in a new way. He was dreaming. And so would they be now and forevermore. Underneath the lupus fiend, the stone floor steamed, turned to lava, and consumed the creature. The lava swirled, rose into a cone, then swelled into a pillar. It darkened, cooled, and became a man. He had a gladiator's physique and the mutilated torso of a dead man. Blood dripped openly from pits in his face. A large chunk of missing flesh painfully exposed the rounded, pearly joint of his shoulder. He looked at the pile of gargoyles and the man underneath them. He looked to the blackened bed. There were no more curtains, only shards of burnt blankets and the skeletal remains of Aveline. Did she know? Did Tumult know what she had done? The knight laughed. It was cynical, triumphant, and shrill. It was feminine. No! Bellowed Korinko Raz. His wounds steamed. The air turned to flame, and an inferno engulfed the room. Gargoyles screamed a mute agony as their hides seared, reddened, swelled, and cracked apart. Though made of unfeeling stone, 
Their conscious manifestation therein was an animal's essence, and it knew it was dying. Lavished and more turned to ash, and never felt a thing, for he was already gone. Little flames licked across the surface of charred stone. Tiny particles of embers twinkled through the air. In a pile of blackened granite chunks and thick soot, tumult glowed. Karinko Roz picked her up with his left hand. The right was limp and useless. He held her before him, his wounded visage blatant on her mirrored surface. You believe... You have imprisoned me the way I have imprisoned you. His words were calm and assured, though the anger grating in his throat made it sound as if several large men spoke all at once. Smugly, he added, I think not. Clearly, acutely, in his head, he heard Tumult's voice. Liar. Then she laughed, <laughs> cynically, <laughs> triumphantly. He wanted to destroy her, but he couldn't. He wanted to bend her, break her. He tried, but he couldn't. He hurled her into the throne room where she ricocheted off pillars and walls, scattering treasures and coins. In the quiet, following the echoes of her din, her laughter faded away. The great eagle limped along the airy currents of a stormy early morning and stumbled onto the platform of the aviary, its wounds apparent to all the retainers, causing them to gasp. The empty saddle turned their gasps into whispers of intrigue. Was Sir Lavishton Moore wounded and stranded? Was he captured and imprisoned? Was he... Dead? A bucket-sized tear fell from Wonderhorn's eyes and splashed upon the cold stone deck. It was grief. The avian master knew Lavish was dead. Such was the eagle's despair, as potent as a mother's to a beloved child, that the eagle would never again accept another companion. He knew this. Yet all else was mystery. And would remain so. This concludes the Auditory Entertainment's production of A Lavish Tale by R. M. Hicks Performed by Miranda Johnson and Ryan Johnson If you would like to see more of the author's work, please visit his webpage at vermilionroot.com Thank you for listening.